The shadows of storm and night. The mysteries of life and light. From unearthly peculiarities, celestial and divine, to apparitions and transcendental signs, you're listening to To The Spirit Podcast. Hello, friends, and welcome to The Spirit. My name is Beck. And I'm Steph. Hi, Steph. Hey, Beck. We have the most amazing guest joining us. Honestly, what our guest has accomplished in her lifetime would take us both many lifetimes over. I'd be remiss in not giving our listeners a taste of how accomplished she is. Our guest today is known as the Voice of Oneness. She is the teacher of mediums, having trained over 20,000 students internationally over the past 20 years. She is a prolific author of 17 books. She's founded Sumeris Psychic Education Center in Essex, England. Her focus is on healing the whole person with her seven proprietary therapies that remove stress, fear, and pain, along with resolving emotional and mental issues that seem impossible to heal. She has been awarded two PhD degrees for advanced work in clinical hypnotherapy and integrated medicine. Her credits include her pioneer work and research in the paranormal, right up our alley stuff, psychology, psychiatry, crystal therapies, hypnosis, religious studies, and her accomplishments as an accurate counselor and unusually adept psychic medium. She's also an ordained minister and currently serving as an elected director of education for the Universal Christ Church School of Spiritualism. She's developed a strong internet presence, including radio and TV shows, videos on YouTube, her international schedule includes demonstrations, lectures, workshop courses, and seminars. She's also available for private consultation and education. And listeners, I'm going to list all of this in our episode details. Please welcome Dr. Margaret Rogers Van Koops. Hello, Hi. everyone. Thank you. <laughs> welcome, Margaret. This is Stephanie. Just wanted to say welcome to. Thank you very much. I, I listening to all the things you said. It's gosh, uh, <laughs> uh, I never, I never really think about all. I just get focused into something and do it. <laughs> well, it's quite a list of accomplishments, honestly. Mm. It's remarkable what you've done. You know, so many different things that you do. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, and yet fortunately, I've also had the dark side, like many women, abuse, misuse, three marriages. Uh, but on the other side of the coin, I'm fortunate I had that because that helped me to understand the sufferings of many other women around the world, uh, particularly, for example, in Japan, where they had still the old idea of harakiri when I was there in 86. Not that they could do it. It's not against the law. But all the belief systems were the same. So when I arrived with two 70 pound cases looking for help, the men walked away. They wouldn't help me. And I ended up with a 10 year old sized Japanese lady who was struggling to carry the cases. I'd had a surgery that undid the surgery because I'm carrying them. I won't bore you with the details. And I thought, what have I come to? And it was the same in India. I go to India to teach and all the men just didn't care about the women they were abusing. So I could see why women today are evolving and have done through the ages of my life. And I call ages because there's periods of time in history where you focus on one thing or another. When I was young mother with two kids, there was no income, there was no national support or anything anywhere in any country. And now today we have that thank God. <laughs> and, uh, you know, social security and all these things. So, you know, as much as women are still complaining, I think they need to take time and go, wow, look what we've all achieved collectively. And there's some wonderful people who are opening up Africa and the Middle East with the idea that women can congregate, make uh, things and sell them together and keep their tribal things going on in Africa or keep their unified sense of self so that the men can't abuse them in the, the Asian and the Middle East countries. Still got a long way to go. But I always felt that my my journey was really of the feminine nature and of course the higher self, the divine consciousness, the holy host is all about divine love through the feminine, even if we're men. <laughs> I agree. Margaret, can we start at the beginning? Um, mm -hmm. Because you have such a very interesting story. And I'd, I'd like to know more about your childhood and when you came into your gifts and your abilities. Well, actually, I didn't really come into them. I was born stimulated. Um, I didn't know, of course, I was an infant. But 
When my mother birthed me, they were cutting the cord. A bomb went over the top of the hospital and landed across the road on top of a couple, I'm not sure, two or three complexes of small apartments and wiped out most people or maimed them. And according to my mother, you know, everybody who was able to go home from the hospital went, but mum being a cripple and having just literally delivered me, decided to leave her in the labor room while everything was going on. And uh, eventually some nurses, after it was all calmed down, heard I'd been born and wanted to come and see life rather than death and came and held me. And apparently they were shaking and they went from shaking to... Uh, and I had that experience when I was in the Great Cheops. You know, you climb up to the king's chamber and you're panting and puffing. And you lay down in the sarcophagus and you can say one and two and three and you're like just in the deepest meditation. And they said they felt that same kind of energy. So I understood it all these years later, but I had no consciousness of it. <laughs> but only my mother telling me when I was older that I was born a healer. After my father came back from the war, I was, uh, when he came back in 1945, April, so I was three. And soon after that, they had the men would come together once a month and sort of reminisce of their times together and support one another. And many of them had legs and eyes and arms and things missing. And uh, I, my mother being a cripple couldn't often come. It was too much for her. She was getting worse and walking was very painful. So dad took me to give her a rest, I guess. And as a result of me going, I would sit on laps and be picked up and put down, picked up and put down and play the one arm bandit. And they would get better. And I would see their auras go from dark colors like dark greens and blues and reds. And they would turn to pearlesque while I was sitting like abalone, you know, while I'm sitting on their lap and I would get really, really hot. And then I could jump down and, and someone else would pick me up. And by the time I was seven, they honoured me. The whole Suffolk Regiment honoured me and made me the only female member of the Suffolk Regiment. I had to stand on the dais with the Brigadier General. My dad was a major and, <laughs> and salute. <laughs> wow. and, and they presented me with a berry and rosettes and things. I still have the rosette, but I think I, the badge and the berry got lost. But... Um, you know, I, I'm not in the records. And anyway, the Suffolk Regiment's long been disbanded, you know, years ago. But it was unique for uh, that to be done to cement in my mind, you're a healer. You know, so that and my voice of God when my sister was born when I was four and a half, literally the light went on, uh, which I couldn't reach to put on because in the house it was four feet high and I'd have to jump to reach it. The light went on and I'm standing looking up the ceiling wondering how the light went on and then I hear in sound around just like you can hear now but there was nothing like that then. You're a child of God, you will know those who have great suffering. After that I was like, well, okay, who's speaking? So I said, who are you? And the voice said, I am the one. And I said, what is the one? And the voice said, all that is. And I said, what is all that is? And he said, the oneness, I am. And I felt all of that consciousness sort of opening up in me without having any clue or any idea what the Dickens it was. <laughs> but my body was shimmering, is the best way I can say it. And that scared me. So instead of going to the kitchen to get whatever mum wanted, <laughs> back into the room where she was with her foot up and my sister in her nestling on her breast and looked at her foot and it seemed like it was suddenly two foot big to me and I thought, that's what she needs, healing. And I went up and put my hands on her and, and I don't know whether I did anything good or bad, but that was my real sign when my hands were hot. I remember they were hot. And so I started to know, you know, the healing side of me very young. And I'd also started picking up rocks, you know, and putting them in my pail and wanting to take them all home from the seaside. And Mother would throw them all away and give me two, you know. <laughs> very, ups <laughs> very upsetting. <laughs> and I remember those kinds of things, you see. And so by the time I was 15, I'd gathered quite a lot of rocks. I have a book called if people are really interested in my life story it's called my journey into the oneness and i have to admit i felt like i was coming out of the closet because in there 
are things that I can never speak of. When I was um, young, you couldn't go out and tell people you could see them and hear them and touch things because they thought you were insane. So a lot of things I had to hide as a child. When I got to be older, I was given my life in the time of Jesus, and I had to be reprogrammed as Margaret afterwards because Margaret didn't exist. I believe that I found the reprogramming of Margaret more interesting than who I was in the time of Jesus, and it's in there. I'm not announcing it hither and thither. Uh, I just feel that those that read it are meant to know it you know, kind of thing. Then the other thing that I could not talk about was all my alien encounters, floating up to spaceships and working with them. And, uh, you know, the fact that I was seduced at 15, still a virgin, and had a, a pregnancy. And I actually brought my daughter up on, on the ship, so I used to go up there. And all the tests and all the things people say they do to us is not in reality. It's all done telepathy-wise. And they watch us from generation to generation. They're not just taking people at random. Uh, and they took my third son as well, uh, and uh, he recalled it. But, you know, the, the things that we go through right now, I think it's dangerous that people are in judgment, in hearsay, and imagination, and illusions. And those who really do have information, they're categorized in the hearsay and illusions and so on as, oh, boo boo, you know, don't take any notice. So for me, my journey, I had to be very aware of the receptivity of the people who wanted to know, you know, whatever it was they wanted to know. And so psychic development, trance work, all this kind of thing was the end thing in this. 60s, 70s, and 80s, and I was doing a lot of expos and things in different countries as well as England, and all that eventually led to me being in America. And by then, I was amazed how behind America was compared with England and Europe. But today, hey, hey, America's ahead of Europe. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah, you, I went back there, uh, you know, they wanted me to be, there's a British Astrological Psychic Society that I was a part of in starting up with the original founders. And uh, it had wallowed down to nothing more or less, and they'd asked me to become head of the education there. So I was doing that from here, but I went over with a whole gamut of stuff that we could do online at that time and I, they just looked at me and went oh um well we get, we're not ready to discuss that the, the time's up we have we've only rented the room for an hour and uh, anyway we like to do face to face <laughs> well oh. they didn't they didn't take my advice and they collapsed because students weren't coming and you know anymore and i was shocked to find that they were still dealing with you know basic tarot cards and it, even when I had the runes nobody could read them and I just sat down with spirit and read the runes you know now today people are writing all sorts of books about things but there weren't any in those days and I didn't consider myself a writer because when I was in school I got spellings wrong all the time my English teacher would do big S's over nearly every other word and I couldn't see what she was on about well years later when they discovered dyslexia, I found out I was mirror imaging. Thank God today even for spell check. <laughs> because <laughs> my fingers, are, I'll write little and I'll write something like I-L-T-L-E or something, you know, and I wouldn't see it. My brain doesn't see it. It's a pattern, you know, your brain sees in patterns, not in words. You know, I used to just throw my books at my husband and he he would come back with Margaret, you can't write like this. It's the sentences are way too long. You've got like five sentences in here, and he started to cut back my work to one <laughs> single sentence. And I'm like, ah, you know, but you're changing the meaning, you know. But after a while, I realized, okay, I get saying you're in America, and of course, we were just thinking American publishers in those days. But since he passed last year, I've written two more books. I wrote one, it's really quite advanced stuff for many peoples, but if they're interested, I've got The Dark Side, which is all about 
the negative side and the connotations of it and why it's so important to us to have it. Because without friction, without negativity, we would be static, you know, we would be still. We would have nothing going on. And then, Very true. Uh, yeah, like, and then, like a balance. Right. And then after I'd done that, um, they asked me to write the light side of the oneness and this is just out and this is really mind-blowing if you're into really understanding the oneness because what it basically is is it saying that the in a nutshell those who we call the ascended the divine consciousness of angels or whatever are descending into embodiment in various forms and shapes it could be aliens or could be a human being born in this time so we've got the higher ascended ones coming down into form, so they're descending. And then we've got people here who are ascending. So there are certain platforms and certain levels where the ascending and descending come together. And in that situation, there's unity, there's stillness, there's a being space. And in that being space, we get new information that's transitioned down into us that allows us to evolve spiritually. So this is a very interesting time because we've come out of the Piscean Age. I've been talking about this for a very long time, how the Piscean Age was 3,500 years, and that goes right back to the Egyptians and so on, where uh, the whole perception was growth in owning, taking, conquering, you know, maiming, whatever. It was all about, I want it, it's mine. With the last series of wars over the last 300 years, which people think is the Piscean Age, it's the inner age of the Piscean Age, there's actually an internal clock going on in the other direction. So for a while we had a double whammy with the Piscean period. And so we had slavery and all these things amalgamate into a big, big thing where the whole world was 1600s and worrying about what property they had or giving things back or trying to be free, you know, whatever. And here we are now, uh, we were in the overlap between the Piscean Age and the Aquarian Age. These are great ages. When the Beatles were young, they used to come down to Fulham where I lived and, and play with Brian in the um, garage. And uh, I had my friend, Cynthia, was the sister of Brian's wife. Okay, <laughs> And so I would go in their house a few times and the boys would be practicing, the two of them with Brian, with their northern accent. And they asked me, Yo, you're psychic? And I said, yes. Well, do you think we're going to make it? You know, and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, <you know. laughs> uh, and uh, that uh, I said more to them. I actually said to John, "You've got messages to give to the world." And he said, "Yes, I know." And he was already into the Aquarian age, and I thought, "Wow, someone else knows it besides me." But I didn't discuss wow. it with him. And of course, he wrote the song. He wrote the song about people. You know, imagine, uh, imagine, imagine all the people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he was very into that, and Paul was more into his ego at that age, because they're teenagers, you know. <laughs> we were all teenagers. <laughs> and so he was like, oh, yeah, I want to be famous. I said, you'll make it. And then the second time I was there, he said, you said we're going to make it. Uh, we've got uh, someone who's interested in us. Should we go with it? I said, go with anybody, because you can do fine. You know, At that age, I, I didn't have any idea about fame. You know? <laughs> I didn't know what I was saying. And the years went by. And then, you know, there's suddenly everyone's screaming and I went, oh, my God, that's the two boys I used to see in Fulham, you know. So I often wonder, if Paul's still around, I often wonder if he'd ever remember that, you know, but I, I would never deign to approach them. Our lives go in separate ways, you know how it is. I don't think we're meant to meet up again. These ways, not that I know of. But it's interesting. I've met the Shah of Iran before he died and healed him, the Princess Margaret, very famous actors, actresses, you know. And it's, it's quite funny because sometimes I know they're famous and sometimes I don't, but it doesn't matter. They're just some person sitting in front of me that we're working with. And I love that because I've never, ever climbed on anyone's bandwagon and I like to be my own journey. And that's basically an amalgamation of 
things that the oneness brings to me and you know there's been lots of pain and suffering and i had parkinson's disease and it's a hereditary thing and that took me into the dna and the rna and and the programming of the soul structure coding deprogramming all of my ancestors in other words which is why i wrote donald trump the enigma of societies i didn't want to write it but um spirit came to me and said they wanted to, and I'm like, no, I don't want to write about politics. It's, no, no, this is about his ancestors. And, you know, I haven't even really marketed it. John Paul's put it out a few times, but I don't know why they wanted me to write it. But now I'm watching and seeing the personality traits of him during the election and so on. I can see his, you know, even going back to the 1700s, his, where we started with his ancestors, I can see their personalities in him. It's very wow. interesting, yeah. It's a real study uh, uh, in um, understanding the different seven parts of our coding in the soul structure coding that develop our personality and characteristics. And that goes into the DNA while we're living. And I, uh, I wonder if that ties into past life DNA as well. Oh, it goes it, back to the first woman <laughs> or man or whatever you want, but we can't read it because it's too much in the ascension. I mean, you know, if you could go back and see someone in, say, let's go just back to Rome, ancient Rome. Like I've got Cornelius Tacitus, who's an historian who works with me all the time. You know, I said to him, well, okay, you know, was, were you an ancestor of mine or anything like that? And the answer is, you're part of us as a oneness. So it doesn't help. In other words, he didn't feel I needed to know if they were an ancestor or not. But in the correlation of me asking, they ended up saying, we're all united, we're all ancestors to one another in some way, in some country, in some time. And when we go back into the oneness, we're energy. And if we want to congregate in human form, we're flickering. And we're flickering so fast, faster than the speed of light. Our spirit moves faster than the speed of light and is faster than the speed of light. Uh, and so if I'm sitting in a class in the spirit world, we say 28 people and they all come from different lives that I've been with, they will see me in the flicker. They're attuned to in a musical note, the key note of that life period. And they will see me as they remember me only. Wow. And, and yet every single one of them will see me as someone they know and identify while I'm sitting here just talking. We here only get glimpses of our personalities and characters when we're channeling. Somebody may look at me and say, oh, I saw a red Indian. And I'd say, yes, it was Red Cloud or something, because he's been with me since I was seven. But I came to learn, too, that some of my more advanced students could actually see me transfigure me from a past life. And uh, they would come up to me and say, I just saw you back in India. And they got the details with it, you know, short thing, like I saw you in India and you were a Raja or something and you were doing this and this. I remember one of my students telling me that years ago. And I'm like, you know, I'd just come back from India too. And she didn't know. So <laughs> it was kind of neat. Yeah. But, you know, that was done for me. She was given that, you know, to confirm to me something that I felt very deeply about India while I was over there. You know, one of the things, I think this might be in my book, I was up in Rishikesh, which is a very high 12,000 feet up sort of monastery thing, not really a temple thing, I don't quite know what it was, but there were two gorgeous monks up there who were, their auras were gold. And they asked me to sit with them while all the other students went off. You know, they asked me to sit with them out on this little balcony, it was no more than two square yards wide. They're sitting down near the wall, and I sat on, on this tiny little wall, which is about as high as a footstool. And he said to me, you're not afraid? And I said, no. And I said, why should I be afraid? And he said, you're sitting on a sheer drop a thousand feet below you. And I just looked over and I went, oh, yes. <laughs> I didn't get up, I didn't panic, I didn't move. Then he said to me, who are you? This is the elder of the two. And I said, oh, I'm a seeker of truth, you know, the usual garbage that one says in those days. And uh, then he said, um, Master, who are you? 
I'm like, master, me? <laughs> well, I thought on it when I was back in England and I was um, teaching at the Whole Life Expo in England. That's for America even had them back in the 60s. So I went into the lecture and I'd already prepped myself what I wanted to do. And I said, okay, everyone, thank you for coming. First thing I want to share with you is I am a master. And every hand in the place went up and I deliberately said, yes, yes. They said, master of what? Are you a master of this? You're a master of that? And I let them ask about seven people, you know, with their ideas of what they thought I might be a master of, telling me what they thought. I said, the answer is simple. I'm master of myself. And I've been teaching that ever since because so many people don't realize that they are responsible for their own life, the choices they make, the things they do. Like take a couple and get married and then six months later they're yelling and screaming at one another, blaming one another. And I walk that pathway so I know what I'm talking about. It's all your fault the way I'm suffering. But it's not. It's our perceptions on how we choose to deal with the situation. We can go into it with a positive light and see the lessons and make changes in ourselves, adapt, or we can walk away. We don't have to stay and suffer. It's an interesting thing, yeah. Many people don't even take responsibility for their own actions. And I feel like we're at a crescendo at this point in time, mm. especially coming into the age of Aquarius. You had spoken about the ascended descending and the descending ascending. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, is there something bigger than we know that's coming? Well, by bigger, what do you mean? A, a person or you mean a situation? Or I mean, what, what are you thinking? No, I'm thinking maybe global, global event, or maybe something that would be the great leveler or unification, something like that. Well, we're actually in it. The COVID, if you stop and think about the COVID, it's a catalyst. The reality of the, you know, we've heard hearsay, and I'm going to tell you the truth. Okay, this virus is 5,000 years old. It was under the ice in the poles. As the poles melted, it was freed. And as it was freed, I was telling people all about it. I have a booklet that's up on, uh, thanks to John Paul, that is, uh, that's my PR guy, that is up on um, Kindle. But unfortunately, it's hard to promote it because the powers that be out there keep, you know, they won't let you tell anything about the virus. But right. the virus is there, and I, I won't go too much into it. A lot of people to, to download it. I told John Paul to let it be like a dollar for donations to our center. But the thing is, I did put it up in four parts on LinkedIn as well. So if anyone wants to go to my page on LinkedIn, just put Margaret Rogers Van Coops, and then go to my blogs you'll be able to read it there but i'm now getting to a point when i want to write more uh the virus is actually not of this world so anybody saying that chinese have made it blah 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 is absolutely ridiculous it has wiped us out before it is an alien virus it was brought here by aliens it is self-rejuvenating it has an amazing mechanism i've described that uh when you look at it it's very um symmetrical it has these little red nodules on the outside of it it's not unusual for by the way for viruses to have nodules it's the way they survive but this one is uh according to spirit is um like a an oval, you know, you can follow them around uh, in circles on the outside of the virus, which is a ball. And so you've got many circles, rather like they do the ley lines on the earth. So they show you the different circles on, around the earth. And the thing about these nodules is that they are uh, able to suck in food, but they're also, and, and pass that down through tubules into the nuclear center, rejuvenate it. But it can also, if the virus dies, then the nodules are birthed to become new viruses. They grow and mature into new viruses. So it self procreates, okay? Right. Uh, and, uh, the, you know, I was telling people. Uh, when it first broke out, that you've got to take colloidal silver, 
Two, you can buy 225 parts per million to 500. It really doesn't matter too much. Uh, and to put the colloidal silver in distilled water, you'd be amazed how many people have come up to me and said, oh, I'm taking it. I've always been taking it. I put it in my bottle of water from the grocery store. Uh, uh, the double oxygen will kill, destroy the silver. You have to have distilled waters, nothing in it. And you put your teaspoon of that into your distilled water, a glass full. Leave it by the bed, cover it so you don't get any dust in it. Drink it about six in the morning, go back to sleep, get up at eight, whatever time you do, adapt it, you know, accordingly. And then eat. And when you eat, put in the probiotics or eat. I like to use um, Chobani uh, because it's goat milk and that's the closest to mother. You know, yogurt, or I'll, sometimes I do, you know, the hundreds of millions probiotic capsule. And uh, the most important part, you must put back all the digestive enzymes because colloidal silver kills everything. It kills off the yeast. It kills off, if you've eaten uh, raw fish, it kills off the amoebas. If you've gotten worms in you, it kills off those. It would kill off tapeworms. I mean, it's been used in Africa and uh, unfortunately, we were trying, I was knowing someone back when who wrote a book about it, which if you, I can't remember the name, but I'm sure it said something colloidal silver. And if you search that online, I'm, I'm sure it must still be around somewhere. And they were trying to get companies to make it and send it over to Africa because when the mosquitoes bite and get malaria, it stops that. Kills the bugs, kills the, you know, everything. It's an amazing thing. It's so, you know, and it's made by a chemical, you know, in a chemical plant where they fuse the water with the silver. Would this be a preventative as well for for the coronavirus? It's not a preventative. It kills it. <laughs> okay. I've heard other people saying high amounts of vitamin C, D, zinc, uh, the quinine water. I've heard many things. And mm. And I didn't know if that's actually just wearing the virus down a bit or if it's actually killing it. No, it's not killing it. What's happening is you're building up your immu immune system by doing that. But if you've got a bad digestive system, i.e. you're out of balance, you get gassy and you get body times are not good, etc. Use your imagination, irritable bowel syndrome. If you've got kidney, and you will have, if you've got a bad digestive system, you will have kidney issues, you will have heart issues, you will have liver issues, you will, you know, and so on, because your digestive tract is not healthy. And along comes the virus, and of course, the first wave of all the people that died were old, they had bad hearts, my husband included, and though it wasn't even known then, uh, he was in hospital through falling and breaking a bone. And uh, that was November, and my friend came to visit uh, shortly for a short period that time. And we both came out of there noticing people were coughing, and the next day we were coughing a bit and fell off. And I said to her, I don't know what it is, but colloidal silver. So we did, okay? Even then, you know. And so I knew, and my husband just went downhill after that, and he ended up with his lungs full of mucus and he passed over. There was nothing anybody could do. But he had been a candidate of a regional heart attack and all the pills they give you, and I'm fighting it with alternative medicine. And I couldn't believe it when I came home from Japan with all the right herbs and uh, alternative medicine things that would have cured him. And he stood there in front of me and he said, I'm going allopathic. How can you? You study with me, you know all this stuff. He said, yes, but the doctor has the magic pill. And that is the problem. Mother takes child to doctor, sore throat, runny nose, gets them antibiotic, and the child believes the doctor. It's in their brains, and it's in the back of their subconscious. It's in the deep subconscious. Okay, trust a doctor. Now, back in the days when I was young, if you were a doctor or a nurse, as I was, you had to learn everything. You had to know every part of the anatomy. You had to know all the treatments. A lot of times a houseman would come on boards and ask us nurses what they should give for medicine because they weren't sure. You know, that's gone. Now you've got nurses who come out. And, I mean, I went somewhere recently. I won't bore you with details. I saw four nurses all specializing in simple treatments. And I'm thinking, I could have done all that in one second. <laughs> Margaret, I was wondering, because the one thing that I've seen 
at least in the past like 10 years or so, is like this uptick in autoimmune diseases. Mm. And it seems to have no end. What would you recommend? to treat Natural. With You've got to go yeah. back to natural. Your but body was not. born natural. You weren't supposed to take in you know, all these augmented foods like pork that's full of antibiotics. We weren't meant to have cabbages growing in runoff from um, the shale things they're doing up in the mountains to find more oil. They're killing the earth. They've got people all over the world cutting down trees. So this COVID is here for a reason. It's here to stop the madness. I did actually have that as a saying back in my 50s, stop the chaos, stop the madness, even then. And it just got worse. And so England has already said of produce, nobody can augment anything and nobody can use this and that in the farms that could in any way be absorbed into the plants. America is full of the GMOs and the toxic mm -hmm, foods. Mm -hmm. And I know that our food is not allowed into the European nation and to the other countries. And this is why you see this epidemic of autoimmune disease and mm -hmm. uh, people that are having digestive issues and cancers. And it's, it's really difficult to try to eat very naturally here in this country, I believe. So my first thing is, if you're going to eat vegetables, as much as people want to have raw, cook it. Because when you heat anything, it destroys the chemicals that are in it. But unfortunately, then it's mush. But at least you're getting something in your stomach. Um, I went out and bought a load of uh, seeds ages ago. They're in my cupboard in case of emergencies for vegetables. I'm in Arizona, so no, it's not, you know, the soil's good if it's wet. There's quite a lot in there, but it's so dry. At least I know that if there was, a, you know, something epidemic-wise that we go back to being cavemen, as it were, um, that I've got a few seeds in there that will bloom and give me more seeds because today you can't buy seeds because you know they've stopped that because they want to control us from growing our own foods because they want us to buy mass marketed foods especially imported ones and when you think uh, that most of our food arrives raw and that we have like for example i bought avocados we grow lovely avocados in california but no we have to have them from israel or from indonesia and they're picked raw and by the time they get here they're like rocks and we don't know what that's doing to us because here i have to say something else when i grew up my body was functioning very well on british food okay I start traveling the world and I start getting issues with my digestive system. At that time, I didn't understand it and I thought, oh, I've just eaten something that wasn't suitable to me. Well, it was much more than that. I was eating food grown in other countries which had different metabolical rate effects on my body because I wasn't taking that into my body as an infant or as a young child. The way the foods are in different countries, it's just like the stones. If I buy a stone in India and a stone in Africa, they're both called amethyst. But when you use them for healing, they channel the energy in an entirely different way. Molecular structure of stones all over the world have come together through explosions and gaseous development into liquids and into form, including the mountains. So... You can see that when you look at mountains, they're different colors and so on. Now push that into your food. You're in a foreign country, let's say you're eating curry, you know, in India, and you're yum, yum, I love it, you know, but your body wasn't trained as a young child to eat curry. So you go home and you think, that was a night, oh, I've got indigestion, or oh, it must be the curry. But you still go back and have more because you like it, and every time you eat it, you're upsetting your stomach more and more till you don't know which way is up. You've got irritable bowel syndrome, and that happened to me. So uh, I started to ask, you know, the one is, what am I doing? And they said, well, you're, you're not living in this country forever. You're here for a short period of time. So your body never gets a chance to really adapt. But, you know, I'll go right back to England, and within two days, I'm normal. I'm healthy because I'm eating what I grew up with. How are you feeling where you're located now? 
Um, well, I've, I've been in this country since I was 40. I'm now 78, so it's 38 years ago. But I've been traveling all over, you know, Japan for so many years, and I went to Egypt and Peru and Europe again, and, you know, so I've been all over the place. So, yeah, it wasn't good for me. But over the last four years, since I stopped traveling so much, and then with COVID as well, lockdown, I've been able to focus on my diet, and give myself foods the way I would have cooked them in England. And since I've been doing that, and also monitoring what I'm eating, how much I eat, I'm normal and I'm happy. And, uh, you know, but there are other things. For example, with the V1 bomb and then the second one when I was three coming over and falling across the street and wiping out whole complex there, that was when I had Archangel Haniel standing over me, and I remember that very well. That's in my book, too. All those things, fear and the anxiety from the war, are so deep in me that hours and hours and hours of meditation, I am still an insomniac. I can't sleep for more than four hours. And when I discussed it with my mother years later in my adulthood, you know, I said, why well, can I only sleep four hours? She said, well, that's the only amount of time we ever got between going to bed and the Germans bombing us. We got four hours apiece. Wow. <laughs> but I can't undo it, you know, because it was happening every night. Programming when you're a kid, everything that you're influenced by, you know, when you're a baby turns mm -hmm. into like programming for your life, right? Exactly. And if you're outside the box of that programming, which most of us are now, even if we're just online, you're up for hours trying to talk to someone who's 10 hours ahead of us in another part of the world, you know, it keeps us up late. We get irrational routines in that it doesn't fit in with our logic or our heart, but we're justifying it let's put it that way why we can't do this and we can't do that or we have to do this and that and we stimulate and motivate ourselves to be against that coding when you had brought us into the amethyst and you had spoken about the amethyst being in africa different different vibration different energy from the amethyst you'd find elsewhere mm -hmm. that was fascinating to me and that leads me into the crystal healing that you do i know that you do crystal acupuncture what mm -hmm. is that exactly it's acupuncture points but instead of using a needle the healer uses a crystal and when when master chan gave me this when i had developed parkinson's disease and i was really shaking and trembling you know my grandmother had it really badly and uh, she was like muhammad ali in the end and my father had started it he was in his fifth well, he would have been pushing 60 or something and i'm 30 something he's about 25 years older than me at the time i'm going to my doctor friends and because i have a lot of doctor friends in those days and i said look at me i'm shaking and trembling and they don't margaret you're you're gonna have a nervous breakdown you need these tranquilizers they didn't tell me they were heroin based <laughs> oh my. and i didn't check because in those days you didn't so i'm tiny little smaller than saccharines you know tiny little pills I carried them around in my purse for six months, never took them because I didn't believe in that stuff. But I was so bad, shaking so bad with the Parkinson's that I didn't know it was Parkinson's. They were saying it was stress in the beginning, right? And I got so bad that I finally decided to take them and went to see my doctor friend again. He said, yes, it's Parkinson's. You've got the rolling pill syndrome and you've got the shakes and you've got this and you can't stand still. Right, you've got to stop your brain working. All this mediumship's got to stop and all that kind of thing. So I thought, okay, I'll take these pills. And uh, over three weeks, because when they wear off, I'd start shaking again. And they were also making me be fuddled. So I couldn't remember if I'd taken them or not. So over three weeks, I OD'd. And then um, Red Cloud got into my body when I was still here and uh, took me to the phone and dialed up a phone number I didn't know to where my husband was he was still my husband then but we were separated i had a girlfriend i didn't know her phone number dialed that number and spoke in his accent uh and deep voice to her to tell him to come home and save me wow my boys were upstairs asleep so he came back found me dragged the eldest out it was about 16 then 
they were walking me backwards and forwards across the living room and I'm standing out of body leaning on the door watching them <laughs> I didn't care about it you know I was just like oh this is interesting <laughs> and then they took me to the hospital and I have no memory of all of this opening up my eyes and saying how many of these did you take and I had a bunch of uh, painkillers and you know things I'd kept in my purse when I was traveling and I kept saying 20, 20, you see. So they wrote me down as 20 of everything, whatever was in there, and told them I wouldn't make the night. Well, I hadn't taken 20 of everything. It, what I had on my mind when I was, you know, doing stuff was I had to have 20 pages of advertisements in the Yoga Today magazine that I was working on at that time. And I only had 10 pages that I needed to have. 10 more so I needed 20 pages to pay for the print oh boy okay <laughs> but they didn't know that but anyway um they didn't know how many of these other pills I'd taken and I didn't know I'd taken way too many either at the time so what happened short version again it's in my book I died and I was like I can't do this work here and I felt the guilt come in and they're like giving up like we put all this energy and time into it and she wants to quit, you know, guilty sort of trip. And I say, well, you have to give me something. I can't stay. My life is so miserable, blah, 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 blah. My husband's run off with another woman, you know, all that stuff. And away uh, we were boys and so on. And uh, they say, we promise we will give you something you'll love. And I went, oh, okay, I'll stay. Well, what I felt was a jab in my heart. But what was proof pudding was the nurse who was assisting the doctors to saving me she was my best friend's neighbor and she banged on her door in the morning when she came off the night system and she told her we saved margaret last night she died so i got the confirmation literally that it wasn't isn't it amazing though how the one this works see having someone present to validate an event to show that it had really happened and it was an illusion or fantasy. And I remembered everything that they were saying to me about their, you have just begun your journey. And I'm like, don't tell me that. I was like, 35 years of this. <laughs> <laughs> well, little did I know how far I was going to spring after that, you know, so, and I'm still springing. And they now tell me, I was born, I didn't know, but uh, they're telling me this now. I was born with the Holy Hosts in my consciousness, which is why I could hear God's voice. And uh, I'm now moving back into that. I can just put my hand up and heal a whole room of people if they're wow. receptive. I've done it yeah, many times in the past, but uh, they're telling me, it. I, I'm not saying I'm in a room full of people right now, but even if they watch me, I've had feedback on it without knowing until they confirmed it, where I've done a video and I've just said, you know, attuned to my face and you'll get healed, and they have. They've written to me saying they have. So remote healing and, and stuff like that, you know, I do, yeah. Wonderful. We need some of that our way. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone in this whole world needs it right now, and I think it's time when anyone like me, and I'm not the only one, there are a lot of us down, who are here at this time to teach people to understand that the Piscean Age is gone. We don't need to own everything. We need to share everything. Um, what I'm perceiving, and it's not going to happen in five minutes, it'll take generations. But what I'm perceiving uh, from the oneness is there'll come a time when, you know, whether it's a dollar, a rupee, a lira, a franc, a Deutschmark, whatever country it is, there will be dollar for that. Dollar for that will be the same value. So there's no like I, I got to go over to Singapore and buy something for three dollars and then bring it back here and sell it for twenty. You know, there'd be none of that. It's three dollars there. It's three dollars here, and uh, there won't be any transport and all that stuff built into the expense of it because they'll have much faster ways of traveling around the world. I also know that the future energy source is sound. We have sound in the magma of the earth that we can tap into. We have the normal sounds of these worlds, even down to things like crickets and 
wind and trees, you know, it's all sound, reverberation, resonation, and those sounds uh, are tapped in. It's like playing a, a violin strings with the bow, okay, friction. And uh, I know that the aliens fly on the speed of light with the aid of magnets and, and sound vibration friction. And that's why they can change direction because there's so many beams of light out there in the universe, you have no idea, uh, from so many different sources. And you can fly on them. You can get from point A to point B in blink of an eye. And same as we as individuals, if we come out of body and do astral traveling, you know, it's like third star on the right, fourth star on the left, and here we are at the planet we want to go to. <laughs> it's hard for people to understand that because we're so limited. And the six million dollar question that people ask me, the answer is simple. Why do we come into embodiment? Well, if we can move at this such fast speed and so much is happening all at once and it's all chaotic and yet it's all serene and tender, it is the I am, how boring can it get? <laughs> yeah, we want some excitement. We want some, so let's slow down. Let's get into this mode of one thing at a time. And yet here we are always trying to do a hundred things at once because it's in our DNA, it's in our memory, it's in the oneness consciousness. Everything is at this moment, the I am all happening at once and to know everything all at once to us is mind-blowing because it takes us hours just to learn the two times table when we're young you know so imagine trying to understand the power of the universe it, it's not something we can understand and then when you think about how many planets and universes in the planets that there are out there we're only just now realizing through people you know, who have been working with the government and alien encounters and all this kind of stuff, are only now beginning to admit it because they were afraid we'd all be invaded, you know. But hell, that they've been coming and going for eons of time. And we've been genetically, biogenetically engineered so many times, you know, according to the, the evolution that we're going through. Because imagine if we were a spirit entity and we kept being born as a chimpanzee. Life after life after life after life, we wouldn't get very far. <laughs> so according to the universal consciousness and transitions of change, we had to be changed. And now, so, do you think that the ETs will help usher us through these changes that you're seeing? Of course they will. They've helped us through unteen other ones before. Why would they stop? No, it's their journey. Will they be more apparent, though, because most people, a lot of people don't believe or... They can't be apparent. Okay, let me put it this way. If we had one person, let's take Jesus as an example, who stands up in front of the people and says, turn the other cheek. People will listen and carry that around in their mind for a while. But hey, after a while, what does turn the other cheek mean? To them it is, okay, let someone beat up the other side of my face. To another person it's, oh, give them a stone face. To another it's like, you know, you could come up with all sorts of ideas when in fact what he actually said in the Hebrew language was show them a different face. It's been changed according to the way you know, religions have taken it. And that is very typical of humankind. So if an alien turns up and gives them technology all at once, which was done eons ago, they learned the hard way that that was not good. It became destructive. So, you know, the world had to flip. It's like uh, Spirit showed me when I was a teenager. I was playing tennis, and they got those little rings around the tennis ball. And uh, as it was rolling, I'm chasing after it. They were telling me, see how the rings are flipping over and yet it's still spinning in the same direction? Oh, yes. I said, well, that's what the earth did when it flipped over uh, and all the great flood happened. And then years later, I got the earth will flip over again. And I thought, well, you know, it won't affect me. It's thousands of years away. But hey, we're already dipping towards the flip. The degrees of the earth's north and south poles and the angles just with the uh, Japanese earthquake it shifted 10 degrees 
And according to science right now, it shifted with the other earthquakes we've had since. And so, you know, it only takes a shift in the magma and we could flip over. And then where would we be? We'd all, a lot of us would be drowned out. And where would we be then with technology? Well, we'd be back to let's light a fire and gather wood and yep. tell stories around the fire. And in no time at all, we would be yet again a new race starting out, evolving. So would they come and work with us? Yeah, of course they would, just as they have in the past. But one by one, a bit at a time. And a lot of them, like the Arcturians, they'll manifest as animals or people or whatever they can do because they're molecularly able to transition. They're shape changers. And they're ancient, ancient, ancient. And their planet, when you go there, they'll appear like little bits of smoke and then they'll come and appear as a human. And then, uh, it's in my book again, put his hand down and just water trickled and the next thing I know I'm sitting in a garden. They can make energy transform to whatever they want it to be. Uh, where do we get that idea? Well, we talk about magic. We've seen it before. It's not new, but we just don't remember it. But it's somewhere deep in our DNA, we believe in magic because we know we can manipulate energy. And spirit can do that too. I don't know much about aliens. Of course, I've heard about them my whole life. Is there evil aliens? Or is it all like benevolent? Of course, there are always different, like we have here, we have white, black, pink, blue, yellow, whatever people, right? I hate all that by the way. Uh, we're just one human race here. But uh, yeah, we've all been manipulated to look different. And we had the DNA of the aliens in different parts of us, which makes us look different. So some of those, you know, through time have, not being so happy campers with us and being restrict and aggressive with us because we've not been following what they thought we would be. And so, yes, there's, there's ancestry and fear relative to certain species, especially when it comes to the greys. There's about six different types of greys, so they tell me. I've only been with the small ones and the four-foot ones. Um, then there's people that say they've uh, experienced reptilians and they literally draw them as reptilians. But I have actually integrated with the species that look humanoid. Uh, and when I saw V, I believe it was, years ago on the television, I was like, oh, my God, because that's what they look like. They look human, but they're covered in like a snake scale. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, uh, when I saw that, I got shudders because I'd seen them on the ships, you know. So that just shows you, though, you see that anyone who's making any these science fiction movies, even like Star Trek and all these things and, you know, Beam them up to Cody and stuff, all of that is known. You know, the body can be broken down to molecular source of energy and reformed. We're just beginning on the threshold of time here to understand when we use certain light with certain crystals. There was a person at the expo I did uh, biomed in L Las Vegas, and I did a PowerPoint talk, but I don't think it was streamed. <laughs> it, was, it was a bit of a mess, but it will be out. They recorded it, and they're going to put it up on YouTube. I think the title was You're Not Who You Think You Are, or that You're More Than You Know, something like that. And I did this whole PowerPoint, and I'm explaining there how everything, the oneness and aliens and all these things come together in our DNA and RNA. So it might be an interesting thing to look up when it's out. They haven't let me know yet. Um, Definitely. Yeah. But, you know, coming back to, you know, whatever we are in some way, if we all knew, if you just woke us up overnight and we all knew exactly our history, what would we do with it? Yeah, you know, we wouldn't have a search program. We wouldn't have a quest. We wouldn't have a purpose. We'd just say, go, okay, so you're, you're part of this and you're part of that. Or we would end up saying, well, I'm better than you because I'm more part of that than you are part of that. You know? <laughs> yeah, it was a point. You know, we're already doing that kind of mode in just everyday living. What they're trying to do is one by one to integrate with us to find people like myself who are naturally able to assimilate with them understand what they're trying to do help them reorganize now 
all the children that are half human and half greys that I know about, that I was teaching on another planet in another universe that I have no idea where it is. And I was, I'm still telepathic with the greys, the father of the child. So he came to me and he said, congratulations. And I said, what for? And he said, you're a grandmother. And I said, what do you mean? She, she has a womb but no ovaries. He says, oh, she's had three children. And I said, how do you manage that? He said, they're your eggs. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> And I always wondered why I never had a girl because every time I got pregnant, there were boys. <laughs> and I learned through that too that the eggs are neutral, but they can tell with their sonic sound vibrations which are more likely to be receptive to female than male. So they take the, the more receptive eggs that are more likely to be female because they want the females because they can reproduce. And so they're making uh, species on, and they're populating. That's their job. The greys that I work with, their job is to repopulate other worlds. You know, we talk about being here but, you know, also what I hear from the spirit world is that we don't necessarily incarnate here all the time. Like, for example, I don't know another planet because they don't tell me, but let's say we'll call it Planet X. And I may have been on that Planet X in a prior life before I came here again. You know, so we come and go, we shift around wherever we want to be. And right now, a lot of the people who are into the aliens are saying things like, oh, I was on Mars. Uh, and I was uh, doing this and that, and I was 30 years doing this and that. Then they brought me back and made me young again and put me on the earth again when I was six. Well, you weren't. That was, uh, they were revealing that you've had a past life on Mars. Not that you were taken off planet, lived 30 years up there, and then brought back as, and changed you back to a young child. So you see how our imagination can go to default. So they don't want us running away with silliness and nonsense, you know. So they only take us one at a time. But they know, of course, that given time, the masses stand up and say, I saw an alien. There comes a time when there be so many saying, I've had an alien encounter, that we will be ready to listen and watch. But we're not now because, for example, look what just happened in the Middle East. we you will be heading all our reporters and you know, all the terrible things that happened. But in the overview, some spirits come into embodiment to do just that, to make us realize that the Piscean Age has ended and we can't go around killing people. And now we've got people saying you can't kill blacks, you know. Well, it's not just blacks. They're killing Hispanics. They're killing anybody they, that looks like they've broken the law these days. Yes. So, you know, it's yet again, we're looking at the end of the Piscean Age. We cannot kill. We must support. We must find these babies and teach them how to be educated. I mean, most of the people on the street have run away from home because they're in dysfunctional families. They're living on what scraps they can find in trash. You know, it's like, hey, we're not in World War One. <laughs> or right. even you know whatever we're here in this time we should everybody should have food in their belly everybody should have medicines we know that but we're in riot about it instead of sitting down and going how can we unify how can we all unify For example, there are medicines in Australia. That country is so full of medicines in plants. And there's botanists over there still discovering whatever could be useful to us. The problem is someone goes over and they find something like act something. And the next thing I know, everybody was buying it. And I'm sitting there going, oh, my God, they don't realize that if they keep taking that, they're going to get spleen issues. And it's harmful. And, and sure enough, they say, oh, no, I hear a batch of people. I'm having my spleen removed. People have to realize that your taste, your psyche, your clairsentience, the minute you put something near your mouth, you know if it's good or bad for you. And you'll see children, mum's trying to put peas in the baby's mouth and the baby turns away. And then she puts cauliflower, all yum yum, and eats it up. 
A baby knows. It's born with clear sentience to know what it wants to eat. And of course, it knows mother's milk right away. Uh, so we are born with subliminal awareness of what's right for us. We're born with psychometry so that we know who's mummy and who's that nasty nurse who's angry today because <laughs> she's just had a row with her husband. The baby knows that and it just cries. You know, it can tell the difference between light and dark energy. It doesn't have words for it, obviously. Uh, I wrote a book about the dark side, which I mentioned earlier on. People should read that and then they understand how important that side is and how it affects us. And the light side of the one is how we are evolving and ascending. And I also have a book, The Rejection Syndrome, that seems to do quite well. That uh, is about the soul coding. And I wrote it with Spirit giving scenarios of different types of coding. They are not reality, none of my clients. They are stories they gave me. But when you read it, you start to see how you come in with an archetype that never changes throughout every life you ever lived. You're always, I'm a warrior and I will always be a warrior. And then you come in with a goal. And in my case, I can talk about me. I have a, a goal of acceptance. So no matter whether it's negative or positive, I have to accept I'm there, I'm dealing with it, and whatever's going on is reality. And in being involved in it, I accept I have a role and something to do. And in the process of that, I'm learning. There are seven archetypes, there are seven goals. And then the next thing is you have modes. The modes give you your personality. Mine is power, passion, and perseverance. I've got the three Ps. Power is like in your intelligence. You know you can do this and that. Passion is the sensitivity to the feelings of the world and whatever. Perseverance is no matter what anybody says, I'm going to keep going. You know, as I'm not going to give up. So I was yeah. well encoded. And then uh, my uh, attitudes are cycles of life. And I came in for my whole life with the idealist. That's like one big cycle through my life, my pathway, if you like. And the idealist wants perfection. <laughs> Don't find it very often, but that's my goal, to find perfection. But then I came through a mother who was a realist. So I get brought up in the first years of my life as a realist. Margaret, this is the rules. This is what you have to do. You can't go over there and do this and that. You know, and my dad would come with, we are high society, you know, our family are royalty, blah, 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 hobnobbing with whoever. And, and that's true. My mother's grandfather was playing chess with Edward V. So I have that background. And ancestry goes back 1600 AD on one side over to France, then goes back further. And on the other side, the Scottish clans, somewhere about 60 AD or something, so they tell me. And here are my parents living in a squatty little apartment with no money after the war ends. You know, it's like, where's all this snobbery? I can't stand it. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, it gave me stability in realizing leadership, you see. Now, leadership doesn't obviously come with yelling at people and telling them what to do, which is what I grew up with. Leadership comes by example. And so I hope I've tried to live myself in a loving way you know, in the idealist way, my point of view of being an example that people can say, oh, Margaret, I want to do what you can do. And I love teaching, sharing and stuff like that and counseling or whatever. And then so passing on through that, I went from the realist, what my parents were saying, to the spiritualist. And into the spiritualist became the medium productively, you know, and, and the religion, the philosophy and the ordinations and all the things that I went through. And psychology and psychiatry and all that, you know. So I, I came out of that and now I'm in the observation mode where I see and perform relative to required of me. I don't have to do something. I'm not learning anymore. So being in the observation mode allows me to be whatever I need to be for people, whoever that's searching and seeking, and I quite enjoy that. Yeah. And then spirit-wise, I'm giving you also you understand your coding. Uh, spirit-wise, we can choose between a higher emotional or a high intellectual or a higher moving center 
or a lower asexual center. And you can have any combination of those seven, or you can have a regular intellect and a regular emotion. And I came in with a higher intellectual, a higher emotional and a moving center. So what that means is that I'm highly psychic, highly, the intellect comes into the emotions. So I'm highly emotional about what I understand. And the higher emotional side comes into understanding and going further with it to discover more news and information from the oneness. And the moving center, I don't look back. There are people that, you know, I really had great friendships I was sitting here musing the other day and I kept hearing that song, Memories, like the corners of my mind. And I've been going back and seeing faces of people that I had forgotten that were so important in my life when I was younger. And there is the picture of their face. And I'm thinking, what was their name? I can't remember. And, you know, because I haven't looked back. I haven't reminisced because I'm moving forward all the time. What's next? What's next? And that's how I'm meant to be, you know. And the last part that we have in our soul coding is what's called the chief feature. And none of them are nice. It's like self deprecation, martyrdom ship, and mine is stubbornness. <laughs> so so if I if I um don't feel that it's right to do I would just, you know, when I was younger, I would have said, no, I'm not doing that. And you thought these and that and judge, judge, judge. But now I just sit back and I, I'm mellowed with it. And I can sit there and just say, okay, fine, you do it. And I'll see what happens. And I wait. And then they come back and go, it didn't work. I go, I, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I use it as a safe mode, really. You know, I just sit on the fence when I need to. But on the other side, if someone says it can't be done, I'll find a way. <laughs> What a great teacher. And I mean, do you feel that maybe this is your last go round down here on this planet? No, no. I, I'm sure I'll be back. We all come and go. I mean, like I said, we could be on other planets doing something elsewhere as well. You know. Dang it. I was hoping this was my last round. I mean, numerology, well, I'm at the end. <laughs> well, you got nine is the closing. But it's also next is zero, which is a circle of evolution that you'll go through in your one is sense, and then you'll have to step into one again. Everything in my book, it was really called The Way to Oneness, and then they published it in Germany, and the German name, Journey into an Unknown World, Reisen and Bekende Welsen. I learned, it took me years to say that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what I didn't know was it was the first spiritual book that went into East Berlin, and they never told me until a year and a half later, and I was so glad for the big check I got that I could put my son through university. <laughs> uh, I thought it was just East Ber in West Berlin that was getting it, and uh, they were fooling on themselves to have it. Well, today I've republished it a uh, long time ago, but it's out there. It's 500-something pages, and it's still got the original text, which is rather dry, but I've padded it with happenings by me, what I was going through while I was writing it, which was longhand on my knee, no computers. At the back is some channeling from Jesus and some of the people I mentioned, the guides that I have, uh, the stuff they said back in the 80s that has come to pass now. One of the things that Red Cloud said, and it's very important through me when, uh, when I was, oh, 40. I was just here and I was just still British, you know, and I was doing channeling sessions for the public or something. And it was recorded. And uh, he said, basically, America should be the first to be proud that you've gone to the moon and should therefore follow the example of being the first to heal the sick, feed the poor and whatever in your own country. America should be the first to be a country that is self-sufficient and uh, we could do it because we got every resource we need here and we're not doing it because we're too busy arguing about whether we can get avocados as said earlier from indonesia or somewhere <laughs> <laughs> and if we show how we can unify our government and by the way franklin came through me just six months ago uh, just to me not to the world and i was meditating in my bedroom and he came to me and he said, this nonsense has to stop. And I thought, what? Who are you? <laughs> he said, I'm Franklin. And I, I said, okay. 
and what do you have to say? And he said, when the four of us sat down, we considered a million or maybe two million people. Our system is out of date and needs to be restructured for the billions that are here. Now, that's going to come, he told me, assured me, and I could sense Roosevelt as well, behind, you know, President Roosevelt. And I sensed here, he didn't say anything, but I sensed his journey at the time was he was trying to change the country. I don't know too much about him, being honest, but, you know, the bootlegging, uh, I think that was around his time. He was trying to bring people to a sedentary state of let's rebuild this country. So that tells you pioneers have been in office before trying to bring this unity. They've been sowing seeds of equality, even going back to, you know, Lincoln, Lincoln yeah, getting the slaves free and so on. It was all... Um, Ownership, money, the Piscean Age, remember, I own 150 slaves. Meanwhile, my family, remember I said I can't stop, they had the St. Ives Islands and they had their slaves. And in the 1600s, they left the island and gave the island to all the people. And if you go there now, many of them have the name Pogson, P-O-G-S-O-N, which is my maiden name. Because my sister actually went to the island and the actual hospital that they built for them is still there and it's a metaphysical center now. It's only a small place, but they kept it. So the British were into giving freedom to the slaves first. And America was behind by about 50 years or something. But slavery has been there since the dawn of time. And we have slavery now, not by owning someone, but the way we enslave ourselves to believe we're limited and restricted. Kids today go to school and they say, I don't want to learn. I mean, if you teach a child like this, once upon a time, there was a town that was so little, but people came and they made purses and they made gloves and they made this and made that. And here's a picture. Do you think you could make some gloves? Oh, no, I don't want to make gloves. Well, never mind, because I've got some and we're going to make some. They're going to touch it. They're going to feel it. They're going to think, ah, oh, today they have too many videos that are just violent things and the kids, they don't know realism. They don't know touch. They don't know feel. They don't know contact. So another thing coming back to the virus, it's about teaching us you're at home, you're alone, start using crafts, start learning to sew, start learning to knit, start learning to do a jigsaw puzzle, you know, like we did when I was a kid. To garden. Yeah. And people have to realize that they can do anything they want if they put their mind and heart to it. Instead, no, they sit there watching Netflix, you know, and, and boring and or online buying stuff. I yeah. was reading something about Amazon has never had as much sales, billions of sales, apparently. That is amazing that well, people are spending that money. Where did they get it from? They're supposed to have no jobs. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> you know, it's like, who's buying all this stuff? Because we don't need it. It's just they've got nothing else to do, so they're putting themselves in debt, I guess. You know, the dollar, I'm not even watching. People ask me who's going to get in, and I have to admit I did say Biden. But I did also say because it's going to be neck, where I put it, neck and neck, like a horse race. But I did. Yeah, yeah, and it was, and it is, and it's come to pass. But I also don't really want to be heard saying this, but I guess I'm on live. Uh, I don't think Biden will complete the four years. Yeah, there's a lot of people thinking that he's not going to make it and Kamala will step up into that role. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And she's the door opener. I hope so. <laughs> she doesn't know it. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> but that's what we need. We need you know young people who are going to follow and support and help and change things. You know, it's going to take 50 years. So I'll be long gone being 78, even if I make, I think I'll make 100 because my dad did. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like my dad. I look like my dad. I'm my body's, my dad's body. I'm, I'm like him. My sister's more like my mom. I'm active uh, and I, I don't even think about 
where I can run on now. A friend of mine who rides a bike every day is one year older than me. We were in a hotel and there was long corridors. He said, I race you. He already started. I called him up and passed him. I got to the other end. I got to the other end. I went, oh, gosh, I can still run. <laughs> You know, so I, I don't think twice about doing anything. I, I, you know, if my back hurts, I go to the chiropractor and I get realigned and off I go again, you know. And I wish people would do that. That's a point, by the way, of healing. Don't suffer with pains. Do hot and cold presses. Also go and get realigned. Your spine, your muscles, your nervous system all rely on those bones to be in alignment. And don't stoop looking on the floor when you walk. Keep your head up. Look like as if you're in the army and you're a soldier. Left, right, left, right. Just be active and, you know, play tennis and reach and jump and run and play golf. You know, all these things that make you swing your arms around and get oxygen in your body. Sitting in front of the TV, eating nuts and cookies and things, it's not going to help you. They have and, to let us out of this lockdown so we can all get out no, there. I, I've got a baby trampoline and I've got some air steps. And I don't do much because I'm actually very active anyway. You know, I'll just get on that trampoline. It's a yard big and I'll just walk on it. And, you know, I can feel my lymphatic system improving. And then with the air steps, I just walk up and down about 20 times on it like climbing steps. When I lived in England, I had uh, two floors in my house, and I didn't appreciate just how many times I used to go up and down those steps carrying laundry or checking the kids or doing something. And so I had really, really strong legs. Now, when I went to Japan, subways, I was always climbing stairs and going out elevators and whatever, you know, to different floors and walking from the subway to wherever I'm going. No cars, you know, didn't get buses, just walk. It's that simple, and, you know, people can walk on the spot. Yes. Once you stop moving, you stop altogether. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my weight right now, I lost weight when my husband died. I was about 130, and I went down to 120. And uh, then I used the telegrams, which are my name spelled back with telegram. But in it is agate. Earth, terror, you know, all these kind of things. So it was a good name. I wow. got slices. I had dyed into different colors. And I was getting from South America, Mexico. I was getting them from China for a while. Uh, you know, I have to go where stocks are. But now I've got a company, Davidson Company. They are putting together a package to sell my crystal acupuncture and telegram therapy with all the books, booklets, and hypnosis, looking for people now who want to carry it and, you know, findings, put the kits together and stick it in Walmart or Amazon or something, which would be wonderful because then people will be able to heal themselves. Yeah. That would be wonderful. Yeah. And now, if they wanted to find that right now, is there a website up for that? As no, it's no, because uh, like I said, they're just, they're still, they told me it would take two to three years and I'm a year into it. And they've got to the stage, and with COVID, that slowed things down as well. Uh, but they've got to the stage where they're presenting it to companies that buy all the stuff and market it to Amazon or whatever it is. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just sitting back waiting <laughs> to see what happens. But in the meantime, I was just thinking myself, I need to go to my in-house stone supplier here and see if they can because I don't know if they can get them from Mexico with all this going on and see if they've got any stocks left of the telegrams. because Lee said I could put the packets of those together. But people, you know, if they've got a crystal shop nearby, they might find they can go and buy the agate slices, but they're going to be polished and they're probably going to charge 10 bucks a piece or something and no booklet or anything. But at least they have some to put on their chakras. I buy the raw. They're smooth where they've been cut, but they're, their edges are raw. So they're natural. And they dye them by the thousands down in Mexico or South America. But, you know, I doubt where they're working. So I don't know if I can find them. But yesterday I did have the feeling to go search. I have a few here. I have a few kits here, probably about 20 or 30 put together and I have some in my garage which is bedlam 
my husband's playground is bedlam. <laughs> okay. he, he left me that bedlam and I walk out there and go, oh my God, and walk back in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. You know, my empathy and sympathy goes out to everyone who's lost someone, whether it's through the virus or not, because there's so much that has to be done. And in, when you have a living will, there's no lawyers because, you know, I've even got a client that's in prison and we can't get her out because the law system isn't working. These are hard times. You know, one of the things I'd like to introduce to law is, you know, they have a thing that if you're arrested and you're a drug addict, they let you go and put you in a rehab. If you're an alcoholic and you've hit someone or done something, they arrest you and give you X number of years. Alcoholics need to be put in rehab because yeah. they're damaged from childhood. I have had clients time and time again who are an alcoholic who, you know, when you go into their history, five and six years old, their parents were supping and they were having a, a drink. They were giving them a drink, taste granny and grandpa's wine or and parents didn't know or whatever. And then they go to school and they got issues. So they start sharing a bottle of wine or something. I've seen it so many times. They are emotionally traumatized. They need counseling. They need more than drug people. They need help. And all they do is throw them in prison and give them 10, 20, 30 years for whatever. You know, yeah. I want to get that law changed. I want it. You know, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I'm going to stand up and speak about it, you know, and help people to hear me and maybe people are reach out to me and congregate and we can get a body of people that can do some legislator to somebody or other to some of the top people who are now ahead of making the laws for us in the country and that would be a very viable law it makes me oh i get emotional it makes me really say if the high court justices can really listen to we the people they would understand that 90 percent of the people who are troublemakers are the offspring of bad upbringing from parents who are the offspring from bad upbringing and we need to change that we need to teach the new generations who are still the offsprings how to be good parents good parenting and there should be schools on there and then there should be the laws change and you don't shove People who have been drunk or whatever drugs in hospital, you put them immediately into a place where they're going to be educated with modern alternative medicine, hypnosis, not psychologists who have studied schizophrenia and paranoia, but people who understand ADDH and dyslexia and all these modern brain issues that are happening now that people have been categorizing as schizophrenia. It's not schizophrenia at all. Paranoia, you know, all these things, they categorize them under all this stuff. And they're not. They're emotionally and mentally distraught kids. And they don't know how to express themselves. They don't know how to laugh. They don't know how to love. They need nurturing. And those people can't get nurtured being shoved in a prison with people who are killers, who are real lawbreakers, you know what I mean? gangsters yeah. and all that kind of thing they're abused when they're in there they get raped and uh, you know, that makes it worse for them and they end up having to join the gang yeah there's a I'm lot of my, work i'm on done. my soapbox now <laughs> no it's fine there is a lot of work to be done in this country exactly as you put it mm. ignorance breeds ignorance and hatred breeds hate and mm. these things do need to be changed from the ground up. And it's unfortunately all has to fall in order to rebuild it back. It looks like that's the only way things are going to change around here. Well, it's going to take, first of all, in my opinion, feminine energy. And that doesn't necessarily mean, see, Biden is feminine. He's got a feminine heart. And so he is talking about we the people. And he means that. He sincerely means that. But he doesn't have the people behind him at this time who can be we the people together with a heart for the people. It's got to come in time and we the people have to stop listening to hearsay and get the facts. I mean, you know, I, I just got so fed up with the news. I know someone who said they were out on a trip. This is the kind of thing that I, I, is dangerous. They were out on a trip 
and uh, found bags of dead people's ballots. I don't believe that. Why would someone dump them out in the street somewhere or hide them in a block somewhere if they've already had the count? It doesn't make any sense. So, you know, these stories are going around and people are believing them. I mean, where's your sense of two and two makes four, not 99, you know? What you speak about is so fascinating and there's so much to learn from you. You're such a wealth of knowledge. Like having a class from you, so we really appreciate it. Yeah, and our podcast that we put out, we just want to put information out for people, Mm -hmm. people that are interested and people that have never heard of anything from the paranormal, the esoteric. They're learning through what we put out in our content. So we just love having guests like you to be able to give that information and to guide them towards if they're interested towards uh, literature, towards books they can read, towards classes Mm -hmm. they can take. And so we loved having you as our guest today. Oh, thank you. I've got this wonderful girl, Katie Kamara, who's up in Washington, D.C. She's half my age. She's a whiz kid on the computer. She's also a producer of radio shows, but they (laughs) have a global live radio. She's very good. She'll have someone on for two or three hours sometimes just talking. You know, she's wow. very good. She's well trained herself from Australia. Uh, so if you look up Katie Kanara, K A N A R A, you'll find her. Anyway, um, what I'm talking about her is that uh, she's opened up my life tremendously in that I had uh, video shows that we aired in Los Angeles and here called Psychic Chit Chat. They're half an hour with me and my husband. So I just got them ripped and sent them off to her. And she's going to put them up on um, YouTube under Psychic Chit Chat. I've got so many things in my head. Psychic Chit Chat. So I, w- I want to put that out because my husband and I did a lot of the things you're talking about, the small things like why tarot cards or, you know, why does a cat see visions? Or, I can't remember all the topics, but I think there's 47 shows. And and I'm hoping they'll be up by December because that's the anniversary of my husband's passing. But they're they're very informative. My husband knew quite a lot, but he would play the fool and ask me questions. (laughs) And then I I was able to uh, respond with answers. And so that was really a good way of teaching back in our 50s. I think it was 40s, 50s, somewhere around that age. And so I look quite nice and young and <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> fat. <laughs> but, but, yeah, so I'm getting those up. And then I've got my YouTube channel, uh, which is just Dr. Margaret, YouTube forward slash Dr. Margaret. But we're going to have more, and we're going to have Ask Dr. Margaret, and then we're going to have Dr. Margaret Speaks, and she's going to put these up as we go. So I have my channel, but she'll have these different stations i suppose on the channel on youtube so that i can have something online that people can go to and actually watch for free and then uh what we are doing is um i've got a website she's we got several websites she's building for me easy peasy solutions dot org there we're going to teach she's going to join me and teach we're going to start with relationships. I'm going to list, you know, all the different kinds of relationships like marriage, affairs, colleagues at work, you know, just off the top of my head, but there's categories. And uh, I'll explain those and then uh, we'll chat and we'll have Q&A. Then we'll take each group of the different types of relationships each week over six weeks and again talk about how to handle relationships what not to do and q a again that's all going to be free and we're asking people if they want to learn from us to sign up and i think she's come up with the donation fee because it's not in my pocket it goes to universal christchurch and universal christchurch is the founding umbrella under which we function as a spiritualist church. And my Sumerian Education Centre that I brought from England is also my charter under Universal Christ Church. So it's a double spiritual whammy. So the money that comes into us will be donations. And that money will pay you know, for technical support and things like that. But we'll also have money where we can maybe build a foundation where we, you know, in time. But we're, we're not looking 
to make money in our pockets because obviously private sessions will pay me. But the donations for the classes will go towards being able eventually to build some kind of foundation where there is education for these young generations to come in. There was a woman that was working with AIDS in uh, California, and as a result of that work there, I went and spoke there a few times too and had lunch with her and stuff. As a result of her followers, they built the foundation. And I can't think of me what it is. But basically, it's selling books and selling CDs of that time. And it's good. And it's out there. And they published a lot of different people's works. But I want this to be an education thing. So people can come on and learn from, you know, different people. There's another guy, a very nice guy. He's Indian. His name begins with V. And he's bringing people on and they're teaching and they're TEDx people. I'd like to do TEDx actually, but I haven't been invited. <laughs> and, and then I found out you don't invite, you apply. <laughs> and you have to wait a year or something, so I don't know. But, you know, the bottom line is he's bringing together great teachers and so he's got an online school that way. But his very connotation is to all metaphysical and health and healing. And I want to do that, but I want to do it as a family unit. You know, I'm always supporting other people. You know, I, I don't ask people to support me. It's not that I wouldn't mind some support because it has been a lonely pathway, which is what a warrior does. They cut a pathway and hope people will follow. But I think it's my time now to unify with a group of people. So my last message really would be anyone out there who's listening to us, if you'd like to help me and work with us and build this kind of thing like a, a foundation where people can go eventually in my mind it will be a metaphysical university where doctors have to go and study alternative medicine as well as surgery example where lawyers have to go and understand psychiatry and psychology oh, all, all around education that's my dream i did actually when i did the expo recently in las vegas the guy who's running it, um, David Sahid, he said, I want you all to say something about the purpose of this event because we need money. We need supporters to make things happen. So while someone else is doing a talk, spirit guides come rushing into me and I'm like, what are you doing here? And we will have to speak. And after she's done, David stands up and he says, okay, I want someone to, who's going to speak first. And before I could even open my mouth, it was like, oh, I'm speaking. <laughs> And they used me to put a message out to say that we need millionaires, billionaires and people to help us build a university of metaphysics. And it's not out there yet. And I hope that when they stream it, it will be out there. Because it was not me speaking, it was the one who's speaking. And it was a powerful message. And even after it was done, they all, everybody who was on the panel went, well, yeah, and I was crying. I was in the bath later and I said, why did you make me cry? And they said, because that's going to touch their heart and soul and they realize it's needed. And I'm like, okay, thank you. But I don't know when it's going to be put out. We do need all of that. We do need teachers. We do need people like yourself that are selfless mm. and that are trying to help humanity to raise the vibration and mm. to love one another and to heal one another. And you're an amazing woman. I'm only as amazing as the spirit world gives me. Remember that. I'm just a human woman. I'm the same as anyone else. I walk around my house going, where did I put that thing? I can't find it every 10 minutes. <laughs> when I'm me on my own, I'm really very silly sometimes. <laughs> well, we loved talking with you, Dr. Margaret, and we hope to speak to you again. And we definitely uh, will put all the information that we have for our listeners to follow all of your many endeavors. Uh, there's one I, I've got, Dr. Margaret Speaks, where I'm going to have, I'm going to sit down and channel whatever spirit wants me to say on video, and we will put that there rather than on, well, I, she may put it on YouTube, but in the moment, you know, it's going to be a site where okay. they can go, and I'm, I'm feeling they're ready to start speaking. I'm just doing what the oneness wants. You know, I'm the medium, I'm the healer, I'm the teacher that the oneness has trained. I'm not trained by anyone else. Never read anybody's books, never studied anybody's classes, other than the basics of my nursing and psychology, psychiatry, that kind of thing was years ago. 
I just evolved, you know, with all the women's education. As yeah. it should be. Yeah. I'm glad, though, you know, because if I'd have studied other people's works, I could have gone off at a tangent and ended up doing something entirely different, you know. So I'm grateful to the ones that they got my back. We'd like to thank you, Dr. Margaret, and we hope to speak to you again. And we're going to oh, check yes. in on you and see where, where you're at because you're moving very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Yeah, maybe next year we'll be more productive online and because and Katie thinks she can do it by then. So thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to also say thank you. It was really wonderful listening to you. You've opened up my mind and I'll be thinking about you and praying for you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Take thank care. You. Thank you for you having too. me. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. To the spirit podcast. Supernatural science. In the I'm ghost. Psychic. Mystic. Spirit. Divine source. Heaven. The dead. Magic, magic.